dear friends, this is Pastor Brad Abley, Professor of Biblical Studies at Elam Theological Institute, and I miss all of you, my friends, in Siaya, and I can't wait to see you uh, this coming March. Uh, today is January the 25th, and uh, Dr. Daniel Gilbert and I, my ministry partner, will be there with you March 9th or March 10th. We leave here from the United States March the 8th, and I believe we get there in uh, Kasumu probably March the 10th. And we can't wait to be with you. And until then, I am hard at work uh, teaching through Old Testament survey what we're titling the joy and the relevance of the Old Testament for today, Old Testament survey part one. And part one, we're covering Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And by the time we're done, we're trusting that you'll have a deeper understanding of the Old Testament. You'll have a better confidence uh, with the Old Testament, how to interpret, how to imply, apply the Old Testament, how to teach uh, from the Old Testament. And that all of this, let us always re be reminded the purpose of Elam Theological Institute is to go and make disciples. That's the ultimate goal for all of us. And we don't think about that enough, but our ultimate goal, our commission from the Lord Jesus Christ, our commander in chief, is to go and make disciples. That's the key. That's why, we, in part, why we study God's word. First and foremost, we study God's word to know God ourselves. And then out of that relationship with him, we look to make disciples, to glorify and honor him and to know him. Amen. Well, it is good to be with you. Opak Ruoth, Opaki Yesu. And we just say, be Roho Maler. Come, Holy Spirit. Njo Roho Mtakatifu. We want the Holy Spirit to come and lead us and guide us and direct us into all the truth. And so would you pray with me now that he would do just that. Walem, <laughs> Heavenly Father, we pray now that you would, uh, Father, before I ask anything, I'm sorry, we just want to stop and say, hallowed be your name. Father, we thank you that you have brought us out of darkness and transferred us into your marvelous light. We thank you, Father, for our salvation. We thank you, Father, that Jesus lives on the inside of us through the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father, that you've called us to minister together with you and for you. We thank you, Father, that you have called us to be ambassadors for Christ and ministers of reconciliation. We thank you, Father, that we are saved by grace through faith and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not works, lest any man should boast. We thank you, Father, for your presence. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your covenant with us, that you are a prayer-answering, covenant-keeping, miracle-working God. And now we do pray that your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and that you would move greatly in our lives through this study. We pray that you would teach us, Holy Spirit, and that you would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts. Give us the desire to make disciples, and even before that, give us the desire to know you and to walk with you. And Father, we pray that you would produce great fruit through this study and that you would be glorified and honored in Jesus name we ask amen and amen now uh, I want to do a before we get before we resume in Genesis which we'll do uh, momentarily I want to do a, a short little devotional with you from Isaiah 26 verses 3 and four, if you have a Bible, if you could turn with me to Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, chapter 26 and verses three 
and 4. Of course, what I'm doing is a devotional from the Old Testament. I love these two verses. I committed them to memory many, many years ago. And it says this, The steadfast of mind, you, Yahweh, will keep in perfect peace because he trusts in you. Trust in Yahweh forever, for in God the Lord we have an everlasting rock. Isaiah says the steadfast of mind, the Hebrew word translated steadfast means to lean upon someone that you can trust with your whole body. It can mean to take hold of, to grab and not let go. It can mean to rest or set one's self upon. I like to, when I'm outside, I often like to lean against a tree or I like to lean against a wall when I'm standing for long periods of time because the tree supports me, the wall supports me. The steadfast of mind, samach is the Hebrew word. It means we're leaning upon our incomparable, faithful, reliable God. We can take hold of Him. We can rest ourselves or set ourselves upon Him, knowing that He won't let us go. So He says, The steadfast of mind you will keep. The word keep means to guard or to watch in perfect peace. Now, what's interesting is the Hebrew word doesn't have, or the Hebrew language does not have a word uh, for perfect. So what, what Isaiah does is he says, you will keep in shalom, shalom. He just puts the word shalom right next to each other. So I wanted to define the word shalom to you, and, and I want to greet you in the Hebrew language. So let me just say this to you. Shalom, shalom, in the name of Jesus, my brothers and sisters. What have I just said to you? I pronounced a powerful blessing upon you because the Hebrew word shalom can be translated safety. I'm praying that God's safety will be upon you wherever you go against sickness and disease and calamity and over all the powers of darkness. It can mean wellness. My prayer for you, my blessing to you with the word shalom, trusting the Lord, is that by you drawing near to Him, you'll find yourself growing in wellness or wholeness. You see the power of this word. And then the word can also mean happiness. Happiness. It can mean prosperity. It can mean spiritual prosperity. Of course, it can mean uh, financial prosperity. But ultimately, the, 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 the ultimate definition of this word shalom is that state of fulfillment which is the result of God's presence. Hallelujah! That state of fulfillment which is the result of God's presence present. Yesai, Yesai, Yesai Ogwedu. Hallelujah. God bless you with his shalom. Amen. Opaki Yesu. Hallelujah. Opaki Yesu. And we just say, Ero Kamano Ahinya Yesai. Amen. That's what the word means. And that comes from Isaiah 26, verses 3 and 4. The steadfast of mind you will keep in shalom, shalom, because he trusts in you. Trust in Yahweh forever, for in God the Lord we have an everlasting rock. And Father, we pray now that those won't just be words, but that you would help us to walk in that richness all the days of our lives in Jesus' name. And when we're stressed, help us, Father, to remember this verse, these two verses, to pause, 
to meditate on them, to declare them, to pray them, and allow the Holy Spirit to come and do His work in us for the glory of the Father and the Son. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, friends, last time we left off in Genesis in this section, uh, in my notes I write, What significant questions does the book of Genesis answer? And I, I just put down many. It answers what the source of the universe is, uh, the source of all that exists. Genesis answers that question. It answers the question, is there a God in heaven? It answers the question, where does the seven-day work week come from that's commonplace in Kenya and in the United States? It answers the question, where did man and woman come from? And where are we going? It answers the question of our existence. What is the purpose of our existence? And the purpose of our existence is to know God and to enjoy Him forever and to make Him known to each other and to those that don't yet know Him. And, my friends, to the people in Siaya who have grown uh, skeptical or cynical of the church, we have to reach those people as well. May God give you His heart for the lost. May God give me his heart for the lost may he give us boldness in the opening of our mouths that we may speak the word of God boldly as we ought to is the Paul prayer that Paul prayed uh, that he asked the Ephesians to pray for him now if Paul needed prayer for boldness I think we need prayer for boldness as well but if we pray that prayer is that a prayer that God wants to answer we know it is but we also need His love and His compassion and His patience and His kindness. We need the fruit of the Spirit as we are sharing the gospel with others. We need to walk in good works so that they may see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. Amen? And we need to appeal to the people that we minister to and lead to also uh, fulfill the Great Commission and share the gospel with the lost. But it's not just so that we can win people to Jesus. That's just the first step. The ultimate step is we have to disciple them. That's what the Great Commission is. The, so the front door is, is bringing them into the kingdom, but then we sit down together and we eat of the delights of God's Word and we learn to love His Word and to obey His Word. That's the goal, is that we should make disciples of Jesus. That is what our Great Commission is all about. Amen? Well, praise God. Now, Genesis answers the question about the origin of marriage uh, in among men and women. It, it answers the difference between, what is the difference between animals and man? Only we are created in His image, and after His likeness, the animals are not. Um, how did sin enter the human race? That's what Genesis answers. What is the source of all the various languages and cultures in the world today? Genesis answers that. Is there a real devil and how does he work? Genesis answers that. The very beginning, the foundation, the foundational principles of spiritual warfare, right there in Genesis chapter 3. What is the origin of the Hebrew race? That is the Jews, the Israelites. It's, it's in Genesis through Abraham. How did the children of Israel get into Egypt? How did they become slaves? That's in Genesis. Key chapters in Genesis, since the call of Abraham and the promises of blessing to the nations through his seed is the prominent message of Genesis, then the key chapters of Genesis 
are those that relate to Abraham and to the Abrahamic covenant. And we find that in Genesis 12 and 13 and 14 and 15 and 16 and 17 and all the way through Genesis 22 where God continually reinforces his promise to Abraham to give him a son and a seed and an offspring. Some of the key people that we read about in Genesis, Adam and Eve, of course, Cain and Abel, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, or in Hebrew it's pronounced Yitzhak, uh, Rebecca, Esau, Jacob, Rachel, and Joseph. All of these are important because Esau, for example, he becomes the father of those that live in Edom, which is now modern day Jordan. And Ishmael becomes the father of the Arabs. And all of that is important. We find Jesus in Genesis. He is the seed of the woman or of the human race in Genesis 3.15. And then in your notes, you can see the New Testament references as well. Jesus, Yeshua is the line of Seth. And you can see that in Genesis 4.25 and Luke 3.38. Jesus is the offspring of Shem. He is of the family of Abraham. He is of the seed of Isaac. He is of the seed of Jacob. He is of the tribe of Judah. Hallelujah. Jesus is everywhere in Genesis. And because of the meaning of, of the Hebrew word Elohim, which we translate God, or you would translate in Luo Nyasai, uh, we see at the outset of Genesis 1 and 2 the vital and pervasive theological concept of the triune God. I think I've already mentioned this, but let me just mention it again, uh, that Elohim is the Hebrew word for, uh, in what theology we call it, the plural of majesty. Uh, Elo, Elohim. I am in Hebrew is plural. Uh, Elohe would be singular. Elohe. But this is the plural of majesty. When we say majesty, we're speaking of the Godhead, um, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So, so, for example, when we see one of the most famous verses of all in Scripture, in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. And then in verse 2, the Spirit of God was born was moving over the surface of the deep. But then we come to John chapter 1 and verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing has come into being that has come into being. In Him was light, and the light was the light life of men. And we could just go on. We find that Jesus, along with the Father and the Holy Spirit, created, we find that in uh, Colossians 1, and uh, verses 15, 16, and 17. We find it in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. We find it in 1 Corinthians. Jesus, along with the Father and the Holy Spirit, Elohim, plural of majesty, created the heavens and the earth. And yet... We worship one God, eternally existent in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Every time the, the noun Elohim uh, appears in the Old Testament, it's always followed by a singular verb. Now, what's important about this is think about the historical context of the Jewish people, of the Israelite nation. All of the nations around them were polytheistic. That is, they worshipped many gods. Polytheistic. Let me write that down. Whoops. 
poly, which is many, theistic. Theistic is the language uh, that comes in English that is from theology. So it's many gods. That's what this is all about. So the Canaanite nations, the Amalekites, the Girgashites, the uh, Hittites, and all of those, plus the Egyptians, they worshipped many gods and goddesses. And yet when God called the Israelites to himself, he revealed himself not as polytheistic, but as one God, Echad, E-C-H-A-D, which is one in unity. One in unity. What that means is, for example, uh, when Israel goes out to battle, they go out as one man, and yet there are many of them. Or when Adam and Eve are joined together by God, they became one flesh. Or when the spies were sent out to the land of Canaan, they brought back a bunch of grapes. Those words are echad, one in unity. But now when God says to Abraham in Genesis 22, when he says, take now your son, your only son, the Hebrew word is Yahid. Yahid. Which is one in singularity. Or isolation. Now, what's interesting about this, when, when God said to Abraham in Genesis 22, Take now your son, your only son whom you love. What did that prefigure? Obviously, it prefigured the father sending the son, uh, his only unique son. Now, when, when God says to Abraham, take now your, own, your son, your only son, Yahid, that is one in isolation. It's interesting because the, um, Isaac was not Abraham's only son, right? Abraham had another son that was born before Isaac. His name was Ishmael. But he was, not, he was the son of the flesh, not the son of promise. And it was the son of promise through whom the Messiah would come and, and bring salvation to the world. I'm, I'm quoting in effect the Apostle Paul who writes about this in Galatians 4. Now the point of all this is, is that we are endeavoring to understand the Godhead. That is absolutely vital. And it's in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, where you have the great statement, the Jewish statement of faith, which says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You see, and that word one is echad, not yahid. He is one in plurality. And yet, he is not three, but he is one. That's why you have Jesus saying in John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. That is one as, as in echad, one in uni, unity or union. It's why he can, he can give us the great commission and say to us, go therefore to all the nations at baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but a singular name, uh, and so on and so forth. We'll get into more teaching on the Trinity at another time. But the whole idea of the triune God 
is there at the very beginning, the very first verse in the scriptures. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Hebrew word is Elohim, the plural of majesty. That is the hint of what's going to come as God reveals himself to us as the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So, uh, Koro, the New Testament points back to creation continually, emphasizing that Jesus, along with the Father, created all that exists. Now, to be sure, the Holy Spirit is also involved in creation, Genesis 1-2. But throughout Scripture, emphasis is usually on the roles of the Father and the Son in creation. Why is that? Well, the role of the Holy Spirit, even though he is equally God, is always to point us to the Father and the Son. That's why we usually pray to the Father in the name of the Son, or we usually pray directly to Jesus. You don't usually see scriptures that um, pray directly to the Holy Spirit. Now, is it wrong to pray to the Holy Spirit? Absolutely not, because he's God. But generally speaking, in the Bible, this helps us to understand why there's more emphasis on the Father and the Son, because the Holy Spirit seeks to glorify the Father and the Son. Why is that significant to us? It's significant to us for this reason, loved ones, that when we are, are faithful to carry out Ephesians 4.3, which says this, Therefore, be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We can learn to be more like the Holy Spirit in not seeking attention for ourselves, but in being secure enough to be God's blessing to others. For example, in Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4, Paul says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or empty conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. And we learn from the Holy Spirit humility. We learn from the Holy Spirit uh, to honor others ahead of ourselves. That's one of the important outcomes of uh the doctrine of the Trinity. So it's in Genesis 1.26, moving on to a different subject, it's in Genesis 1.26 that we discover that man and woman are created in God's image and according to his likeness. That is in the spiritual and moral sense, because the Father is spirit. Now, what's important about just that teaching alone, that, that male and female he created them, is that it is the role and the responsibility of men to treat women as equals. Our sisters in Christ, our mothers, our biological sisters, especially our wives and our daughters, because they are created in God's image and, and according to his likeness, every bit as we are as well. And so we are to honor our wives as fellow heirs of grace. And if we don't, uh, Peter says our prayers will be hindered. We grieve the heart of God. And so men, it's our responsibility every day to speak kindly to women, to treat them honorably, to serve them, to help them, to minister to them. Not to see them as sex objects, not to make them do all of our work for us, but to lift them up just the way God has lifted us up from being his enemies to his friends and his sons and daughters. My friends, if the men of God throughout the world would treat women with that kind of respect and honor in the fear of the Lord, it would change our world.
It would change our world. In our country recently, uh, there's been um, a scandal that has been exposed of very powerful men in positions of great power. Uh, a very, very powerful um, movie producer was found to have forced women to have sex with him and, and, was, and only then would he give them significant roles as actresses. And that, that came out recently. Women were afraid to mention him by name because they were worried that their careers would end. And then we found that the same thing was happening uh, from very powerful men in politics and business and the media, well-known names. And, it, and it's, it's always happened throughout existence. But it's brought great shame to men in our country. And primarily because men are not doing what we're called by God to do, and that is to treat women as our equals. Now, there is a difference when it comes to a marriage, for example, where, uh, where the man is the head of the wife. But he is not the head of the wife to dominate her, but he is to love her and serve her and honor her. And she submits to him as unto Christ. But of course, he submits to Christ as well. All of that, dear friends, is right there in the book of Genesis, particularly Genesis 1, 26 through 28. I guarantee you this, I guarantee you, that if you men of God would begin to take seriously the word of God in how to treat women, that can you imagine if the church throughout Kenya did this, it would turn the nation of Kenya upside down and the women would absolutely flourish in their lives. May God help us to be doers of the word and not hearers who delude themselves. You know, on my bookshelf, just below this camera, is a picture of my own mother when she was in her early 20s. And you can see that she is just, uh, just a beautiful, beautiful woman. See that there? And I honor my mother. She's in heaven now. But humanly speaking, if there's any good in me, it's because of my mother. It's because she taught me um, character. She taught me respect. She taught me, uh, she loved me. She, she just worked for me. And... Um, she taught me how to read and write. She gave me a love for, for reading. And she imparted to me uh, to treat my wife Maureen with respect and honor. So I honor my mother as, as probably the most influential person in my entire life. Let's honor women, shall we? And bring glory to and pleasure and, and honor to the Lord. Amen. In Genesis 3, we learn of man's fall into sin, and that resulted in the image of God in him being corrupted. However, the New Testament teaches us that the role of the Holy Spirit is to restore that lost image in us, forming us, to be more like Jesus, which is a clear teaching of the deity of Jesus. The primary verse there is Romans 8, verse 29, and then 1 Corinthians 15, verse 49. You can see it here in your notes. And then Philippians uh, 3, 1, uh, 21. And then Colossians 1, 28. I highly recommend, loved ones, that right now you pause 
the video and, and look at those verses because the reason that they're so important is because this is our goal in discipling others. The goal is to get out of the way and not make them dependent upon us, but always to point them to Jesus and do all we can to help them to become more like Jesus. That's the ultimate goal in discipleship, depending upon the Holy Spirit for that. So I would ask you to, to look at those verses now and pray over them and thank God for what he's doing in your life and ask him for opportunities to tell the unsaved that they are created in God's image and likeness with a purpose and a destiny and a future and a hope and a reason for living. You share that with people, it'll explode in their hearts. But that that purpose and destiny can only be discovered in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Teach these things, fellow saints in Christ, fellow bond servants in Christ. Teach these things to the believers that God has entrusted to you as well and watch them take off in their relationship with God. Watch zeal in their hearts begin to grow and then they will go and tell others and more and God will add more and more people uh, to your churches. Amen. Let's believe God for that. In fact, let's stop and pray. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that in 2018, you would add more and more people to the churches that are represented by these men and women of God. Father, I pray that you would add many more people. I pray that many of the churches, I, I pray that all of the churches represented right now would double in size, but not just numerically, but that they would double in quality as well to the glory of God in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. There are many types in Genesis as well. Several of the types that portray the Savior in Genesis. Adam is a type of Christ. You can see that in Romans 5 verse 14. That is, as Adam is the head of the old creation, so Jesus is the head of the new creation. So Adam is a type by way of contrast, not similarity. Similarity in the sense of Jesus in his humanity, but a type by way of contrast in that Adam rebelled against God and Jesus obeyed God perfectly. So the the English word would be anti-type, anti-type. Abel's offering of a blood sacrifice points to Christ who would die for us. Abel's murder by Cain may also illustrate Christ's death because you have someone that died innocently as a result of someone that was jealous of him and hated him. Melchizedek in Genesis 14 is a type of Christ. You can see that explanation there in Hebrews chapter 7 verse 3. Joseph, uh, and Genesis talks so much about Joseph, doesn't it? There are at least 13 chapters dedicated to the life of Joseph, Genesis 37 through 50. Joseph, who was loved dearly by his father, was betrayed by his own, by his own brothers. He was betrayed, given up for death. And yet, Joseph became the means of their deliverance from, uh, from certain death when famine hit the land of Israel. And, and his brothers had to go back down in, into Egypt. So Joseph is a type 
of Christ. Isn't that wonderful? And then now in your notes, you have uh, an outline of Genesis. And that will lead us now into a brand new study in the book of Exodus. I can't wait to get into the book of Exodus with you. The book of Exodus is a very, very rich book. There's so much to learn. And um, we'll get there in our next uh, broadcast. And until then, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. God bless you.